Welcome to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show, a real estate investment program. Listen and learn how to use real estate to build wealth and passive income streams for you and your family. We bring you experts every day to discuss and answer your questions on everything from single family homes all the way up to 600 plus unit apartment complexes. And now, the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Welcome to the show. This is Andy Webb with Lifestyles Unlimited. And as always, we're working on your financial freedom. Hey, and I had a question the other day from someone, a very, very broad question. And simply put, very succinctly, it was, what is better, cash flow or capital gains when it comes to a real estate investment? What is better, cash flow, that that asset is kicking off cash every month, or capital gains when I buy it over the course of the hold, et cetera? And that's a hard question to answer. Again, it's very broad. And really, it, it depends on your goals. What is it you're trying to do? by way of your investment in that asset. Now, I would ask you, why not have both? Why, why not have both? And when we invest in real estate, residential, rental, real estate, single family houses or apartment communities, uh, we, we do often have very much of both cash flow as well as not just capital gains, but equity that we create over the lifetime of that hold. Forced appreciation in the example of apartments where I can go in and really make some changes and push up the value. That's a type of gain that I'll see when I finally dispose of that asset or do a cash out refinance. But really it, it does, it comes down to your goals. It comes down to your capital, where you're starting and, and so on. And, and this very question actually dovetails very well with a, with the show we did last week. I was looking at an article with you this type of article typically comes out at the start of the year, setting goals, doing stuff like that. And in particular, we looked at eight steps to creating or, or building or increasing, I should say, your net worth. And uh, you can go back and listen to that show. That's at lifestylesunlimited.com. That's archived on the radio tab. Click on our podcast there. So we looked at the capital gain or the, the equity, the wealth building side of that equation. And during the course of the show, I realized, hey, let's, we're going to come back. We're going to look at cash flow. And, and, and again, I got that very question, which is better? Well, you might ask yourself the question, if you're carrying debt, which is going to help you more? Now, really, both can help you. If you think about it, you can convert that equity into cash flow at some point, of course. But today we're going to focus on cash flow. Cash flow is what's going to really get you to that financial freedom that I opened the show with. So again, last week we looked at growing that net worth uh, fueled by an article that I'd come across. This week we're going to look at cash flow. Now, I was curious what kind of articles are out there in the Internet related to that very topic of creating extra cash flow. I just did a search and I'm not going to go through any articles with you on that topic, but almost every article that I did dive into because I wanted to see what they say, almost every single one of those mentioned rental property among sundry other things. And of those sundry other things that they mentioned, many of those were not passive, doing things actively to create that cash flow, which sounds like a second or a third job to me, which is not what I'm, what I personally am looking for. But again, rental property, investing in rental property was in every article that I looked at. So you can do your own search, get out on your favorite search engine. We're going to talk through that notion of cash flow today, creating extra cash flow. I've got a couple of ideas for you to use when you approach this to maybe help you take what may seem a very daunting task and, and break it down into more, let's say, bite-sized chunks. And in fact, one article I did come across, which I'll bring up briefly, concerned very specifically paying off one type of debt. I'm not going to, again, dive into the depth of that uh, particular article, but I want to use it as a, a good segue to the notion of what we call cash flow chunking. So we're going to get to that, but I want to start with a more of a macro picture and some of the news, some of the things that's happening that are, that are, that are happening right now in the United States. We'll get to a big statistic that came out just a couple days ago, but before I get to that one, I want to talk about wage growth, because when you think about cash flow, when you think about having more cash flow in your life, certainly that's one place where you may think first, hey, I, my job, where I'm working, can I get a raise? Can I, can I see higher wages? Maybe work overtime. And I was curious. I said, okay, wh what do we see? What has been going on more recently since we've started to come out of the pandemic? We hear about the great resignation. We hear about labor shortages. We hear that wages are ticking up, but what does that actually look like? And very interesting site for you. And I'll caution you. 
if you're a guy like me and you like the sort of statistical stuff, it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> so handle with care. But if you go to the uh, website for the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, they've got what's called a wage growth tracker. And it's got data through November of 2021. So reasonably current, I would say. And in particular, you can select any number of data sets. And, and I started to go through this. And I just want to give you a couple of these data points. And we're going to tie this into another number here in just a moment, which I think will be very eye-opening for you. And the overall, this is across everybody, every industry, everything that they look at, the overall wage growth year on year, November 2021, 3.7%. Now, I can remember doing shows a couple of years ago on wages, on bonuses, or not bonuses, on, on merit increases, raises, that sort of thing. And that's about the number we saw back then. So it doesn't seem terribly changed. Now, if you dive down into the statistics, which you can do, you can really drill down here on this wage growth tracker. The older age group, older cohort, 55 plus, 2.2%. Well, as you get into those golden years and you're thinking about retiring, you need more cash flow, not less. You want to continue to plump up that, what? Retirement account, supposedly. We talked about that last week as well. 2.2% growth year on year. 25 to 54, big bucket, 3.8%. So we're fairly reasonably represented in that overall number. Who is seeing the big wage growth? Ages 16 to 24 at a whopping 10.1%. Now, we've talked a lot on this show about the... The great resignation, a lot of those that are resigning or leaving their jobs voluntarily are in those lower paying hospitality and leisure roles, and they're just rolling into the next one that does pay a little bit more. We've heard about the push to, to raise the federal minimum wage hasn't fully gone through, but a lot of companies are taking up the minimum wage, even up to $15 an hour. We're seeing that there. We're, we're seeing that in that number. What else are we seeing? Now, from the files of Del Wamsley. We've got all these people that are struggling wanting something to happen but it's a problem that does not exist in our society so it can't be solved in our society well what do i mean by that well if you go to financial planners these guys they're talking to you about how can you make some financial moves and adjustments so that 40 years from now or by the time you're 65 years old you'll be able to survive now that is their problem and they have their solutions to solve their problem. But as Einstein says, you can't solve the problem at the same level of thinking that the problem was created at. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Andy Webb. If you have any questions for me, you can email me at askandy at l-u-i-n-c dot com. That's askandy at l-u-inc, l-u-i-n-c dot com. And we're looking at wage growth year on year as of November 2021. Again, this was on the website of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Uh, it's, their, it's called their wage growth tracker. Very cool tool if you're interested in this sort of data. I spent uh, probably far too long <laughs> digging through this, but I want to give you, again, some of what I saw. And boy, that 16-year-old to 24-year-old cohort, if, if we break it down by age, you can do that there. They, they saw 10.1% increase in wages year on year. Good for them. Of course, they're starting where at a very, starting at a low uh, uh, basis. So it's naturally easy to see that increase, especially when we hear things like Amazon or McDonald's or whoever going to a $15 minimum wage. For people in my cohort, which is very broad here, 25 to 54, just 3.8%. If you're a little bit older, 22 Now, again, we've heard a lot about the great resignation. What about those that are switching jobs? Are they seeing more? Well, if you're what they define as a job stayer, somebody that's staying put, you're seeing 3.2%. If you've joined that number that's in the great resignation and you're what they're calling a job switcher, meaning you're not staying out of the workforce, you're quitting, going somewhere else, what is it? 4.3%. Not even a terribly big number in my view, certainly better than the overall average, which is 3.7. Industry to industry doesn't change a lot, 3.3 to 3.9%. So not a, not a broad uh, differential there, depending, you know, based on your industry. Men. Men, we... Saw 3.4%. Ladies, you're doing better at 3.8%. Very good. Education. 
And we talk about the conventional wisdom path on this show all the time, which is the notion that you go to school to get good grades, to go to college and get those good grades to get that better job. Who's doing better as of November 2021? Well, if you hold a bachelor's degree, you've gone to college. Remember, overall wage growth was 3.7% for, for the year on year in November 2021. If you hold a bachelor degree, meaning you went to college, they don't go above that here, 3.4%, uh, so you're a little below the average there. If you got an associate's degree, maybe a two-year degree at a, at a trade college, 3.2%. If you made it out of high school, and that's it, 4.0%. Almost points to the question of, did I, know, did I need to go to college? Well, you have to answer that one. The last one I want to look at here is wage level. And again, this kind of supports what we talked about in the prior segment. If I start from the lowest quartile, so they've broken this up by 25% brackets, those in the first or the lower quartile, 4.6% increase. That ties out to everything we've heard. Second quartile, 3.5, third, 3.3, fourth, 2.8. So obviously diminishing returns when you already have a higher base when you're when you're starting this review. I understand that. I would think you would as well. Higher earners, in essence, are worse off when it comes to capturing that that added wage growth that we we hear about from time to time. For you, maybe there's a different direction you need to go. And especially when you hear this next number, and this next number may blow you out of the water. You may have heard it already. It's the largest we've heard in 40 years. Inflation. What's it done? They just published the December number. It rose 7% year on year. Again, highest since 1982. Just in December alone, prices were up half a percent, and that puts the year on year uh, growth total at 7%. Again, fastest in 40 years. I don't know about you, but I do notice that when I go to the fuel pump. I notice it when I go to the grocery store. I'm noticing it in all areas of my life. I'm drinking a cup of coffee right now. I brew my own coffee at home. I'm broadcasting from the home studio. That coffee that I used to pay $9.99 a can for is now $12.99. That's a 25% increase. So we're definitely, we're, we're definitely feeling it. But I think the bigger question now, and where you're going to feel it, and most people in this country will, is with 7% inflation, what did we just hear about wage growth? It is not quite half that number, 3.7%. So is wage growth keeping up? Depends on who you are. If you're at that lower basis point, younger crowd, you know, starting at a lower baseline, hey, you're, you're, you're seeing some growth. That's good. Um, but for most of us, the answer is no. The answer is no. So wages are absolutely not keeping up. This takes me to the later part of the show where we're going to talk about creating cash flow because now it is incumbent upon you to take that ball in your hand and do something for your situation and create that cash flow that you can do. You absolutely can do. You know, my wife and I, when we joined Lifestyles Unlimited about 10 years ago, it was specifically with that very goal of creating cash flow. At the time, my wife did not like, in fact, she abhorred, hated, just despised her corporate job and she needed to get out it was it was taking tolls on her health literally and we said we got to get that cash flow together to get you out of your job and that's the first thing we did it took us just about three years i can remember when i got the call she said i'm at my end i am at my end i need out of here cash flow was there she held on a little bit longer than she had to uh, being the trooper that she is but hey she got out of there and and everything has been so much better since I can tell you, but it came, it came down to creating that cash flow. So wages are not keeping up. You have got to do something for yourself. What is the outlook now for inflation? What are we going to hear as we continue over the next few months? I don't know. That's anyone's guess. My, my guess is that it's going to continue to go up. It's going to continue to go up. Now I look at sundry, like I said, stats and dove into the federal reserve Bank of Atlanta stats on the wage side there. Very interesting stuff. Another place I like to go is the CAS, is C-A-S-S, CAS Transportation Indexes. And basically, this company, what they do is they track truckload line haul rates. Basically, the, the cost that companies are paying to trucking companies to ship their goods. And as 2021 closed, they said shippers were paying 8 to 11% more. 8 to 11% more in truckload rates and 33% more per domestic, staying within the bounds of the country. So we're talking externally as well as internally, 33% more 
for a domestic shipment. Now, do you think that's going to translate down the road to higher inflation? Anyone's guess? I suspect that it will. What do they expect? What is the outlook for freight? I'm just turning the page here. They suggest that there are challenges to the industry in terms of capacity in particular. In fact, it's worsening that again as, as, as the year 2022 begins and they're seeing absenteeism surging across drivers, maintenance staff, as well as personnel um, at the transportation companies. And they expect, they expect a hit here. So what do you expect? What do you think is going to happen? You need to ask yourself that question and take some steps to prepare, whether it's just simply short up the the gap now that we have in terms of our income and inflation and the cost of everything that we buy in our lives or getting out of that job that you despise much like my wife did now what is it seven years ago you've got to take some action and what I want to do with the balance of the show now is work on giving you some tools just some mental tools some things to help you think about cash flow and your your monthly expenses We're going to head into a quick break. I'm going to hit one more article here, just very, very upper level. That's going to be be the real segue piece to get us into cash flow chunking. So stick around. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Andy Webb. If you have any questions for me, you can send me an email to askandy at l-u-i-n-c dot com. Again, that is askandy at l-u-i-n-c L-U-I-N-C dot com. I I do answer those personally as quickly as I can. And I love to have your questions because it fuels ideas for for the shows for me as well. I have a lot of very well thought out, very thoughtful questions. If you want to learn more about Lifestyles Unlimited, go to lifestylesunlimited.com. You can catch our past radio shows there. You can read a lot of content. There are a lot of articles posted out there on various topics. Whatever it is you need to know. Is it what is a hard money loan? How does that work? Protesting my property taxes. A lot of great articles on that topic that will be coming up on it are we going to see some inflation there Ooh, you bet you bet we will lots of other information out there as well go to lifestylesunlimited.com and while you are there you will see a little yellow button that says free workshop click on that it's an hour and a half of your time and we'll go into what we do at lifestyles unlimited and we'll talk about investing in single family houses as One option, we'll talk about multifamily apartment communities as as another option. So you can give you some numbers around that so you can really see how those play into the topic we have today, which is adding more cash flow to your life, creating cash flow. And again, we talked last week about the other piece. You know, we make money five ways in our real estate investments. That's that's why I love this asset class. It's, It's the cash flow that we're talking about today, which is the thing that retired my wife and got her out of that job she abhorred and has gotten so many other investors that I know to their financial freedom and to early retirement. They are real estate retired. But aside from the cash flow, there are sundry equity plays in there. We we buy right, so we're getting most of these assets at a discount, and we're capturing equity. That's just protection, that's buffer while I hold the asset, but it's immediate wealth that goes to my balance sheet. And then when I sell or do a cash out refi down the line, I have more cash to to use to to dispose of to then invest in more assets and while we're in that hold period we've we've got equity build up as our residents pay the mortgage for us because we do leverage these i can go a lot farther across many properties with a hundred thousand dollars let's say than if i pay a hundred thousand dollars all cash for one then i've got all these properties with residents in place paying down the mortgage for me getting that equity capture seeing that equity build up and what who what have we seen lately appreciation which is why those property taxes, when you get that, when you get that uh, appraisal from the county appraisal district here in a couple months, uh, don't don't be shocked. Here in, in Dallas, values are up something like twenty percent on average. It varies, of course, across the board, Texas and, and nationally. We we saw double digits for the year, and you will see that you will see that when it comes to your tax bill. But we enjoy that appreciation because we can then leverage that by again by way of cash out refinance or by disposing of or, or selling that asset and rolling those returns into the next ones. Which what does that do for me then? Create more cash flow. This thing feeds itself. I already mentioned a term, cash flow chunking, which we're going to segue into now. Later on, we're going to talk briefly about what the cash flow snowball, because I'll tell you, when you start to set these things in motion, they start to roll and they roll faster and faster and faster. And before you know it, you have hit that finish line. You are financially free and you can be real estate retired. But let's talk about a little bit of a mindset item here first and foremost. So last article here for you, this was in Market Watch um, just yesterday, in fact, and it caught my eye. It's, the title reads, who should and should not consider using a personal loan to pay off holiday debt? 
Again, this was published uh, on the 11th by Alyssa Wolfson. And essentially, in a nutshell, what it's talking about is replacing high interest credit card debt. If you went through the holiday season, you know, I've got a five year old now. His birthday is very near Christmas. So we're, we're, we got the double whammy going on here. And if you're like me, you, you put, you, you fund those gifts with the credit card. Now, I don't let that thing go on. We pay that off immediately. It's just a pet form of payment. But if you are not able to pay it and you're, you're, you're dealing with that and it's rolling on and on and on, you know, it's a high interest debt. So they're suggesting that, hey, maybe consider getting a lower interest personal loan to offset that. And they go through some pros and some cons here. I'm not going to get into that with you, but I do want to get to one, one thing they say. Consider alternative solutions. Are there other options out there? We're going to get to that option, in fact. And then they go on to say, and this is great advice. We talked about this on last week's show as well. They say, make a budget. Now, they're talking about forward-looking for the purposes of the next holiday season, right? Or whatever it is that you have on your plate to buy. Make a budget so that you can avoid even considering this notion of personal loan or whatever it is you think you need to do to clear that debt. And then they talk about making a different plan. So I'm going to roll all of those together and talk about something that we at Lifestyles Unlimited call cash flow chunking. By the way, again, making a budget, we talked about that on last week's show, good Good policy, good thing to do. In fact, we focused on that enough last week. I'm not going to dive terribly into that here. Having that budget in place or, or at least tracking your, your monthly expenses by, by upper level category, it's going to help you do two things. And we'll, we'll get to that here in just a moment. And it will help you with chunking. Now, what is cash flow chunking? I'm going to give you an example from my personal life to help you understand that. And, you know, you, you may have heard me broadcast in the past from what I call the RV bunker. I'm in my, my home base today, but sometimes we travel around in, in an RV and I do my broadcast from there from various locations. I have a blast while I'm at it. I'll tell you that. Well, when we picked that RV up at the end of 2019, I had some choices to make. Pay all cash. This was an entry level, not $100,000 unit by any means. We could have paid all cash or finance it. Now this RV was about $23,000 out the door. Payment, monthly payment, because we did finance it, $227 a month. Nothing massive. Instead of putting all cash into that RV, $23,000, we said, you know what? That's opportunity cost right there. As soon as I do that, that money is gone. It's not yielding me anything. Typically, RVs are depreciating assets, although in this current environment, like used vehicles, it's actually gone up. It's, it's, it's a little mind-boggling, but despite the 8,000-plus miles we've put on it in, in, the, in the past couple of years, it's gone the other direction. But normally, it is a depreciating asset that is yielding me zero financial return. So we said, you know what? We're going to keep that cash because guess what I can do instead? I can put that into a single-family house or into a, a multifamily apartment community as a passive investor. And I can yield cash flow. And I can see that equity capture. And I can see that equity buildup. And I can see that appreciation. And in, in, in the case of those apartments, that forced appreciation. And grow my net worth like we talked about on last week's show. But more importantly, create cash flow. To do what? To pay off that debt. Yeah, but Andy, you've got interest. Now, now you're now you got all the interest expense that's going to make it actually a more expensive RV, don't you? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I absolutely do. But here's the beauty of it: I buy that one house, I take on the the net cash flow each month. We'll get to that, and I point that cash flow to the RV debt. The cash flow I get on average for the houses that I buy is about four hundred, maybe five hundred dollars a month. So it's more than that monthly cash flow. Can I throw a little bit more extra at that? Sure, I can. Um, or I can accrue that for another purchase thinking about the snowball, but we buy that house and then each month I take that cash flow, which I have associated now or, or accrued towards that one particular debt, that one chunk of debt. And I use that cash flow to pay down that chunk. I point it at that RV debt. Now over a period of years, I clear that debt. What's happened? I still have that depreciating asset that, well, depreciating RV, but more importantly, I now have that cash flowing asset in my portfolio. And what does it do? Unlike that money I threw down that black hole when I bought that RV, had I paid all cash, instead I've got cash flow continuing to come in the door. And in the meantime, that house has appreciated. I can do a cash out refinance. Maybe I want to sell that, do a 1031 tax deferred gain or sale, defer the taxes on the capital gain and roll those in the next couple of properties and create even more cash. Well, you create so many options when instead of simply paying cash because I want to avoid the interest expense and I feel more secure, I just don't want to have the debt. 
you take on that cash flowing asset instead. So cash flow chunking in essence is finding discrete pieces of your P and L your, your, your outbound cash and finding cash flow to match to that. What can you chunk? That RV payment is an example, your car or your, your monthly truck payment, your mortgage payment, your student loan bill that you pay every month, your monthly grocery bill, that daycare expense, utilities. You bucket it in a way that makes the most sense for you, which takes us back to that budget. You need to know what's going out in order to assign cash flow that's coming in. So stick around, we got one more segment and I got a little bit more to share and I wanna get into that cash flow snowball as well. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Andy Webb, and today on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show, we are focused squarely on cash flow. Why? A couple of reasons. Number one, I got the question the other day, what's better, cash flow or capital gains or equity when you invest in real estate? That depends on your goals. That depends wholly on your goals, where you want to be in two years, five years, 10 years. Now, I will tell you, my thesis is, and we talk about on the show all the time, you can do both. Uh, we make money five different ways with our real estate. If you want to learn more, go to lifestylesunlimited.com and uh, click on the free workshop button. It's just an hour and a half of your time done online from the comfort of your home. In fact, I'm looking at the schedule here coming up. I see workshops at noon, 6.30, 8.30 p.m., 9.30 p.m. So you'll find something that works with your schedule. But we talk about that. We talk about the various ways that we make money. And we're getting into one specifically today, which is the cash flow, which in light of the fact that as we saw in the first segment, wage growth is a little unchanged, despite Despite everything we hear about the great resignation and can't find enough workers and increasing the minimum wage on the whole, it's nothing phenomenal, nothing stupendous, unless you're in that very young age bracket where they are taking up the minimum wage. We're seeing 3.7% wage growth as of November 2021, year on year. Hold that against 7% inflation year on year for December. There's a big gap. There's a big gap, but you can close the gap. You can close the gap by creating cash flow. You know, if I think back 2014, I remember the year very clearly, the place where I worked at the time, I was not doing well. Uh, this is a global company. And because they were not doing well, there were no raises that year. I was irritated. But that year, I bought five single family houses. I gave myself, I don't know what it was, 20, 30K raise that year on my own. So company, you know, I looked at them, I smiled and nodded. I said, okay, <laughs> you know, the end's coming. It's coming soon. Created my own future by creating that cash flow by picking up those assets. You can do the same. Now, we're talking about cash flow chunking right now. I want to wrap up this conversation, and it's a very good way to, 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 to help you think about your personal situation and, and, and really to take the numbers apart and, and take something that maybe seem, seems a little bit unattainable, make it more attainable. And it starts by sitting down and doing something we talked about on last week's show as well, sitting down and, and getting together a, a budget uh, forward, you know, budget being forward looking, but also looking backwards at your, your monthly expenses so that you can see just what is that number? What am I spending? What are we spending as a family every month? But don't get to just that number. You want to drill it down and have that bucketed by expense categories. Why? So that you can identify those chunks of outgoing cash to then go out and target inbound cash. So what are your monthly expenses? And when it comes to financial freedom, you do need to hit that upper level number at some point, of course, that's when you become financially free. When everything going out the door is met by inbound cash flow. If you as a family are spending $4,000 a month going out, well, you need 4,000 coming in from your passive investments from real estate. And that's going to make you financially free. Well, to break that number down, if it seems daunting, cash flow chunking is a great way to mentally take that bigger number apart makes it more attainable. If you think about smart goals, those are goals. They, they need to be specific. They need to be measurable. They need to be attainable in this case. Uh, they need to be relevant and they need to be time bound. You know, I set some goals for myself this year around real estate that involve both single family. We want to keep buying that as well as multifamily. I want to buy a house per quarter. We, we don't need it from a financial freedom perspective any longer, but I enjoy that. I really love working on the houses and, and seeing that turnaround in the cash flow is wonderful. So I've got goals around a house per quarter. What are your goals? Well, you got to sit down and figure that out and doing that budget, getting that upper level number, getting those chunks will help you doing it, help you do that. The easiest way to eat an elephant is how one bite at a time. And that's what those chunks are. And as, you know, as I closed the segment last time, that can be very easily identified by your sundry debt loads, your, your mortgage, your car payment, your, your truck payment, your boat payment, whatever that is, your, your utilities, your, your, your daycare. I've got a five-year-old now, right? He's costing me an arm and a leg, clothing budget, etc. 
figure out what those are, and then start to make plans to bring in that cash flow. How do you do that? Well, we talked about single family as one option. You know, I've got, in fact, I'm going to pull up my email here. Um, I get emails from the Lifestyles Unlimited Realty team pretty much daily. Um, and they will send me a property that says, hey, I've got this property available. They'll tell me a little bit about it, just very upper level. And I decide if that fits my goals around, or around a particular investment. If so, I follow up on it. And just looking at the subject lines, I'm not even going to open these up. I see one here. It's going to cash flow. This, these are projections based on market rents what they've seen for lease comps in the area, as well as everything else that that realtor knows. These are experts at what they do. And he's projecting, in this case, $462 in net cash flow to my pocket per month on this one investment. Here's another one. Doesn't say I don't see it there. $403 cash flow per month. $432, $405. Good numbers. Again, if you have outflows of 4000 a month as a family, now what do you need? You need 10 houses that are cash flowing $405 per month coming in the door to meet that upper level. That can seem daunting. Break it down. What is your car payment? $300 a month? Hey, pick up this house right here, cash flowing $405 per month. Match it to that outbound cash flow. You're set on that payment. Wash, rinse, and repeat. It gets even better. I'm looking down a little bit farther. A couple that came out over the weekend. $574 per month cash flow. Here's another one. $572. On average in Texas, we tend to see about $400. It, it ranges anywhere from $200 to maybe, as we saw, $500, $600. I've seen $700. It comes down to the asset. Markets, submarkets all vary a little bit. You'll, when you get your education, you become familiar with this, and you learn how to read these various markets. You learn how to read these uh, this data from realtors. You learn how to decide what is the right investment for you because you now know how to put the numbers together, and you go down that path. Now, you've been cash flow chunking. You use your cash flow chunking approach to target that, that consumer debt, let's say, credit cards, those auto loans, student loans, whatever else you need to pay down, and you've identified some outbound cash flow that maybe is not debt related, your utilities, your, your monthly food bill, et cetera, home mortgage. Now you continue to throw monthly payments at that if you want, but I would tell you, and we talked about this on last week's show as well, when you get to a certain level of debt equity because it's not performing for you, do that cash out refi. What else has started to go up lately? Interest rates. Are they still historically low? Yes, they are. Is it still a good time to buy and do that cash out refinance? It absolutely is. Get that cash out of that personal home. Do that cash out refinance so that you can do the very things that we're talking about right here and pick up that cash flowing asset to create more cash flow in your life. Yes, you'll reset the debt on that house. Yes, that mortgage payment may go up, but your net gain across your portfolio of assets and debts will be positive if you're doing it right. So thinking again about cash flow chunking, you're going to resolve that, that consumer debt, keep that home mortgage into place. And the beauty again of not just simply throwing all your cash at your debt, or in my case, in my example of not buying that RV all cash, is that once that debt is paid off, we talked about this already, now you have a cash flowing asset. You've got an asset that's continuing to throw cash at you, even though the debt that it was matched to is paid off. Now what do you do? Well, let's talk about that cash flow snowball. You get that thing rolling. You give it a nudge. And I'll tell you, in this case, cash flow begets more cash flow. You're going to funnel that now freed up cash flow that you had allocated to those debts, and you're going to start to put that into an asset account for the next investment. Now, it'll take you a little bit longer to get to that next house, let's say, but then you get that house. And what's it doing? Well, you no longer have that debt to point it towards. You've already got your other living expenses covered by those other chunks of cash flow coming in. This is now investable funds. Put that in that asset account. Get that next house or get into that next passive multifamily deal. A couple months, a year later buy the next one. It all starts to go faster and faster and faster. So that cash flow chunking leads to that cash flow snowball leads ultimately to what we talked about on last week's show, which is greater net worth. So last week we talked about eight steps to creating a higher net worth. That was the, the article we looked at and we worked through that together. Today we've been talking about cash flow. So if I had to put steps together to get you to more cash flow, here's what they would be. Number one, education. 
I already mentioned the Lifestyles Unlimited website. You can go to lifestylesunlimited.com, click on the free workshop button to learn more. As well, I want to make you aware, coming up mid-March, great place to go to get education is our Wealth and Passive Income Expo that's going to be in Houston, Texas, March 16th through the 19th. Passes are on sale now. You can go to wealthandpassiveincomeexpo.com. Again, wealthandpassiveincomeexpo.com to learn more, but multiple days where you can start to work on that education around investing in single family or apartments, whatever it is you want to do. There are so many breakout sessions, so much to learn, so many people to meet. Network is very, very important in this game. You will come away resolved. You'll come away with your passive income plan in hand in order to do the things that we talked about today. Education number two, figure out that budget. Identify that upper level monthly outflow as well as those chunks. Number four, set some goals to pick up cash flowing assets to offset those chunks. Clear that debt. Number six, then finally give that cash flow snowball a firm nudge to get it rolling. And this will dovetail again with last week's show, building that net worth. Now, from the files of Del Wamsley. 20% of the activities you do in life produce 80% of your results. That's his efficiency ratio. Now, it's obvious in life, if you can do more of the 20% that makes a difference and less of the 80% that doesn't, you can be more successful. So it's that line. Here is the line. You live, let's say there's a line where you are exactly an 80-20 person. Successful people are more like 30-70 Unsuccessful people are more like 90-10. What I mean by that is the people who are unsuccessful spend 90% of their time doing stuff that means nothing and only 10% of the time doing something that's effective. Very successful people spend 30% of their time doing something effective and only 70% of their time doing something ineffective. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. You have a good day. The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show constitutes an endorsement recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.